Blog Talk Radio. Well, here we go, ladies and gentlemen, across the board. It's number two. It's We landed in Cleveland, Ohio. We just finished up Kim Blylevin's uh, great talk and candid podcast. You want to catch that one? A great interview with Jennifer Garrett. Boy, I'll tell you, with uh, uh, the, the colleges she's been through and the, and the degrees and having five kids, boy, an inspiration for women uh, all around the globe on that one, too. So you want to check that one out. But this is the American Sports History Podcast with uh, my good friend, Peter Ray. Yours truly, Mark Mancini, producing it, 347-205-9631. You can catch uh, it on any of the uh, uh, podcast platforms, wherever you subscribe to, powered now by Mancini Media. So without further ado, it's more of him, less of me. Let me lay that red carpet down, put the podium in its place, hand off the mic. First of all, Peter, how are you? Second of all, how can people get a hold of you? Third of all, you got a great guest, and you got a week off next week. So, uh, boy, I'll tell you, man, we're we're all blessed with the holidays coming up. Uh, hi, Mark. I'm doing well. I have a YouTube channel. It's my name, Peter J. Ray, R-E-A, and you're absolutely right. Tonight's guest for the seventh time, the uh, NBA player from 1980 to 1995, and uh, the author of the book, Celebration, Your Gift of Life, From the Verge of Suicide to a Life of Purpose and Joy. Welcome to the show, Mr. James Donaldson. Hey, Peter. It's so great to be back, and I'm really, really enjoying our ongoing, every couple of weeks, uh, segments. You know, we, we talk about a lot of things. We talk about sports, of course, but a lot of things to just make the world go around, you know, life in general, and hopefully our listening audience is getting a lot out of this. That's great. Now uh, I've been going through your book, and uh, it's wonderful how you're you know you're very uh, honest and open and candid. And uh, in chapter four, you talk about my sham marriage. You wrote mm. one of the most stressful situations I dealt with in 2018 was coming to the realization that my marriage was nothing but a sham. You had met your wife online; she was Chinese, and you went to China uh, and to meet her. Per- in person and you wrote it was quite the scene me this very large human being seemingly out of place in mainland china hanging out with a chinese woman and then uh or she were married and then uh, everything went well until about june 2017 then i went out of town for a weekend golf tournament in sacramento when i came home sunday evening our house was eerily quiet and looked like it had been mostly vacated I went looking around the house, but my wife and her son were nowhere to be found. The little boy's Mm -hmm. room had been cleaned out and all his clothes taken away. When I looked into our bedroom, the closet my wife and I shared was half empty. All her clothes and personal belongings were gone. This incident, so your wife had left you, this incident sent me into a serious cycle of depression, anxiety, loneliness, and suicidal thoughts. For the rest of 2017, I came home to a big empty house, void of little boy's laughter and playing, void of her cooking great meals for us every evening, void of anybody sleeping next to me. Every day when I got home from running around Seattle, as soon as I sat down, the walls of the house started closing in on me. Here I was alone and listening to a lot of the negative self-talk that goes on when you're in such a situation. It was very sad, but somehow I made it through the summer and early fall of 2017 until Thanksgiving approached. Then I was really at my very worst. I felt suicidal. Nothing seemed worth living for. Every aspect of my life was upside down and over. My business was hanging by a string, and I was spending my life savings trying to keep it afloat. My health was still iffy, so I could hardly do anything I used to. My mother died that same year, which was another big blow to deal with. I was undergoing an IRS audit of both my personal and corporate finances, which ultimately left me owing hundreds of thousands of dollars I'll never be able to repay. So everything was upside down. I was hurting and hurting bad. Yet in the midst of all that darkness, even when I was waking up at 1 or 2 a.m., I always knew God had a plan for me. God was allowing me to go through these things so I could have firsthand knowledge of what it's like for somebody in dire straits, feeling suicidal and feeling devoid of hope. Uh, okay, let's see here. That that was exactly where I was. At times, I seriously doubted I would make it through the holidays. Every day, every hour was a struggle just to get through. It was a desperate time, and I was grasping for straws. Finally, I realized something was definitely wrong with me, and I needed help. 
I reached out to my family physician and began the process of getting the medical and personal care I needed. I also reached out to my close group of intimate friends to help me. People asked me if I asked me if I was angry with my ex-wife. I replied, "No, I'm not. I have a very forgiving heart." Today I feel much better, and I'm so glad I made it through. I would love to get married again. I waited 53 years for my first marriage, putting it off until a time when I could really focus on it. I had traveled all over the country playing basketball and being so immersed in my career that I really couldn't pay attention to marriage before then. I knew I couldn't do both things well. One would suffer. As a professional basketball player, I did not want my career to suffer. As a small business owner, I did not want my business to suffer, so I waited until my business was mature enough to be run by the management group I had in place. I would love to get married again. I'm still very involved with the Chinese community and plan to stay involved because I enjoy Chinese culture, and I have so many wonderful Chinese friends. I would even possibly like to find another Chinese wife. Hopefully, I will find someone I can really quick click with. I don't think that's difficult, but it's not as easy as you might think. Plus, I learned long ago that even when I put my plan A, B, and plan C together, in the end, it's God's plan. Whatever God has laid out for me is what the plan will be. So I've learned not to get too attached to any future hopes and just make sure I can do the best I can. Any thoughts, Mr. James Donaldson, on your writing, <laughs> your words? Uh, <laughs> you know, you're bringing back a lot of memories, and... uh I remember when I was in the midst of all that, writing all that down and going through it all, uh, you know, there's the old proverbial saying, uh, waiting for the other shoe to drop. And, you know, after a couple of major open heart surgeries, after my mother passing, then my wife leaves and my stepson, her son, pack up and leave. Uh, The IRS audits, you know, the financial ruin, my business closing, bankruptcy, foreclosure, one shoe was dropping after another, and some days I kept asking myself, how much more can I take? You know, how many more gut punches can I take? Uh, losing my wife, and she just packed up and moved on. Uh, I don't know why. I still don't know why. I never heard from her again. She sent me a text message telling me she'd bring the car back that I had bought her, and she did. She left it in the driveway several days later. I never saw her and never spoke to her again. Um, you know, marrying a, uh, a a foreign woman from abroad, uh, she wanted to come to America and get her green card, become a U.S. citizen for her and her son, and have her son get an American education. I, w- I was all for that. I mean, I was in love with her. I thought she was in love with me, but it turned out after she got the green card and after she saw that I made it through my couple major surgeries, uh, she packed up and moved on, and it was just crushing, just really a crushing blow, which is why I call it a sham marriage. Uh, I got married for the right reasons, because I loved her and I loved her little boy, uh, little boy, you know, 12, 13-year-old. Um, I don't know why she got married. I don't dwell on it too much. Uh, I don't chastise the whole a whole the whole woman population around the world or all the Chinese women. I I just don't. This is one individual that did one horrible thing to me and to us. And I've had to just forgive and move on. And I'm back in a good place again. My heart is open. My mind is open to give and receive love and trust. And that's what I hope will happen in the near future. Uh, But like I, like I talked about, like you read, you know, it's all in God's time, and it's all God's plan. So I'm I'm waiting for him. Ron from New Rochelle, New York, says, Hi. He says, you and I are amazing. Here's a nice little title, The Two Sum Every Two Weeks. Sweet. Uh-huh. <laughs> Ron. <laughs> and like Larry, from, Larry from Spokane, Washington. James, your story is amazing, fighting through all these demons. God had you through this and will continue to bless you moving forward. Peter and you bring so much hope to me and my friends that continue to listen to this great inspirational show. Mm-hmm. Let me let me say this, Peter. You know, uh, I do realize that God brought me through all this and had me experience all I had to experience because if I was going to get out there and do the work that I'm doing now, being a voice and advocate for mental health awareness and suicide prevention, I had to have firsthand experience. 
you know, for 30, 40 years, I'm going around to schools and talking to kids and telling them, just say no to drugs, you know, say no to drinking, resist peer pressure, stay off drugs, stay in school. But, you know, I've never done drugs myself, so I don't know what that experience is like. I've never drank a drop of alcohol, so I really don't know what that attraction and that addiction is to drugs and alcohol. But this this mental health challenge and depression, I know firsthand. And it's one of those things that you really don't know unless you've actually been through it. So I've been through it. God let me go through it. He brought me through it. And he put me back out there to say, okay, now you know, and you get out there and help others. Yeah, it's funny when you're going through these hardships, you think, oh, it doesn't seem to have any meaning. Until, but then later you can look back and you think, all right, I got through it. And then, and then you know, we need to care about other people. And a lot of people don't care. We need to care. And I think when you've been through something like that, it does make you feel like, oh, you want to think, all right, there are other people going through this, and then you do care, and then and then you do know if someone might be going through a nightmare, and you want to do, if you can do anything just to help them a little bit too. Uh, and I think the when you have severe depression, it's good to look at what you're try to make changes, see what changes you can make if you can in your lifestyle or whatever. But sometimes you just have to you have to endure. And um, yeah. and I think, you know, one thing I'd say to depressed people is that you think your life has no meaning. But um, staying alive actually is en- – enduring has great meaning. If you look at this yes. country, the beginning of this country, Valley Forge, the, the winner of Valley Forge, the Continental Army of the men who were fighting for independence, you know, that was a – great moment in American history with George Washington and those guys. And all they did was they stayed alive and they did, you know, and they were, mm-hmm. they survived that winter. Well, a lot of them died, but, but um, starved to death, and for, but they endured. And we, we need to understand that uh, the, the, the importance yeah. of endur- endurance in life, which is just living with something tough. And that you That's- think it doesn't mean anything. This is a war, but it does. It has great meaning because it's, it is going to come right. to an end and you don't know That's that, but right. it will because God is real. And he created us, he loves us, so he doesn't want us to be miserable forever. And he wants us to run the race. He wants us to persevere and hang in there no matter what, no matter what. And we will get through it eventually. There's the old saying that suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. So the problem is temporary, even if it lasts two or three, four, a decade, years, Uh it will eventually end if you keep on hanging in there and working your way through it. Yeah, I, I, so I think that's yeah, that, that's what's important, and uh, we can uh, um, just yes, yeah, staying alive, and and then and, and then that's the thing I would say is there is hope. You might be yeah, you, you go, you're going through a hell. You think there's no hope, but um, but there is, and uh, that's right. And if you it, and if you stay alive, you think. Some days you think, oh, I didn't do anything today. My life is worth. No, you stay alive. You did something. You're still alive. Mm-hmm. And if you stay mm-hmm. alive another day, it's going to end, Things and things are going to open up. So just keep staying alive another day and, and talk right. to God, and, 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 and things are gonna, things will, will t- turn around. I hope our listening audience is taking something from all this because <laughs> that is the essence of what we're talking about. Everybody out there listening, you might be going through tough times now or next year or 10, 20 years from now, but just keep hanging in there. You'll get through it. Yeah, I deal – I work with older people who, you know, they're, they're, they're going to die. You know, they're at the end of life, and they feel like their life is worthless or that it's really tough. But I try to tell them that, no, it's – you know, um, and, and we, we need to – we do a better job. We all need to do a better job of looking out for people who are really in, in uh, bad, you know, in having a very tough time, and do whatever yeah. we can to lighten their, to re- try to raise their spirits and try to make them feel good about themselves, that they're not worthless, that they're, uh, yeah. you know, that that you know that they are. There is goodness in them, you know. We so we and yet yeah, to try to lighten because they're just going through really hard times, especially old. Well, you have older people, a lot of severe depression yeah. in, in the older people who's they're bedridden mm-hmm. and stuff like that. So, anyway, yeah. uh, let's see. So, uh, so um, Mr. Uh, James Donaldson, you want to talk about your work currently with uh, 
in terms of your mental mental health work you're doing? Right. I, I currently serve on several different boards around the Seattle area uh, for mental health awareness. Uh, NAMI is a national organization. NAMI stands for the National Alliance of Mental Illness, and I'm a board member for the Seattle chapter. Uh, we're starting up a couple other chapters nearby, and I'm involved with that. So we are really the advocates and the voices for mental health, spreading the word, spreading the message, trying to destigmatize what this is all about. It's okay not to be okay. It's okay to ask for help. And we've just got to do a better job of that. Uh, With this pandemic and the shutdowns and the restrictions that we've all been through the last couple of years, this has just been taken a toll on everybody from young people all the way to the senior citizens all of us have been feeling the pressure the stress of being locked down of being isolated of not having a normal normal as we normally do and so we'll get through this too but right now we need each other more than ever before getting through this very difficult time we're all going through trisha from mckeesport pennsylvania she writes She's listened to a lot of shows. That she says we hit the nail on the head. Move over local news. Make way for Cleveland, Ohio. Thank you so much, Tricia. The uh, yeah, the the um, you know I think the thing is uh, that we've been living in a troubled world, and we, the thing is we all need to change, and we all need to care, and we all need to believe that God does exist. See, that's the thing. A lot of people, I, and people that bad experiences maybe in church. When they were growing up or whatever, and that's too bad. That's a shame that maybe God has a bad name, because uh, I know God does exist, and He's He's a positive force. There is God's yeah. justice, the law of karma. We have to behave, and a lot of times we misbehave, and we think, "Oh, why did this happen?" But um, mm-hmm. but on, but the, God's love is is greater than that. There is there is forgiveness, and there is elimination of there is grace, you know. And so there is just like a loving parent, you know, you love your child. Your child misbehaves, maybe you have to punish them so they learn. And God does that, but when the child is learns a lesson, that the love the, the, the love is greater that the parent has than, than the the issue of you know discipline. So the, love, so the parent will say, "All right, he will." The parent will will say, "All right, that's enough of punishment. You've learned your lesson." Yeah. And if we can do that, then and really serve God. And you yeah. serve each other yeah. instead of all of us going around thinking, oh, what do I want? What do I fight? You know, everyone going, spending their day thinking about what they want and ignoring it. We have to see, cause see that there are trouble, see how we can serve God, be his instrument. So, uh, and I can see that that's True. what you're doing. And that's just so inspiring, you know, to talk with you. That's right, uh, Peter. And without being overly preachy, because our listening audience may not be there with the walk and faith of God like we have, you and I have. Some do, some don't, and that's okay. Uh, We're just sharing our experiences and and sharing our encouragement uh, to try to find the way. Uh, I believe God's real. I've been a lifelong Christian, grew up in the church, still go to church every Sunday, uh, and I know he's real. I know he brought me through this for a purpose and for a reason, and I'm putting that purpose and reason to work every single day And every single day, it is just a cherished, blessed day that I don't ever, ever take for granted, and I never, ever will take it for granted again. When I I was 11 years old, my older sister um, was sick for a short time. She was almost 17, and she died very very Mm -hmm. suddenly. And Mm -hmm. she was a wonderful person. And, you know, my parents just thought, oh, this was so unbelievable. And, and, you know, as terrible as it was for them – uh, they became better people because they they became aware that there's a lot of uh, tragedy, a lot of you know death comes at different times, and so I can see. Look, now they're both gone now, but I look back on that, and it was a terrible thing, but good came out of that, and they they became people who were interested in in reaching out to others, and particularly parents who had lost children. So good can yeah. come out of this stuff. These these tough situations that we go through, I know good can come comes out of it. So that's yes. something to try to keep in mind when you're going through a nightmare. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Wow. Wow. You know, I, I blog daily on mental health awareness stuff. Uh, I've got a blog called Standing Above the Crowd. Uh, you can find it at standingabovethecrowd.com. And it, uh, it's all about mental health awareness, uh, advice, tips, helpful hints, uh, encouragement. It's just talking about the vast array of different mental challenges that people go through 
Uh, today, for instance, was about uh, 13 steps of how to treat and raise our young daughters, our young girls in our society, instead of objectifying them, making sure that they feel value, building up their self-esteem, uh, you know, praising them for the good job they're doing instead of how beautiful they might be on the outside. All of those kind of things. They're really, really helpful. So all your listening audience, you can find it at standingabovethecrowd.com. Uh, send me your email address, and it'll be coming to you every single day. Now, shifting gears a little bit, uh, the NBA, you played against quite a few of the NBA's top players. Uh, we've gone through mm-hmm. four uh, last week. Uh, what are your thoughts on Larry Bird? Wow, Larry was one of a kind. He, what a competitor. I mean, he wasn't the most athletic, wasn't the most graceful, but he had heart, he had determination, uh, and he had a will to win. And I remember playing against those great Celtic uh, teams. Matter of fact, the Boston Garden is the only arena I never, ever won a game in. Never. Uh, and so I think that leprechaun is real up there, <laughs> you know, sitting on the rim, batting away the last second shots and things. Uh, the Boston Garden was a great place to play. But Larry was just uh, ultra competitive, and he came in uh, to the Dallas Mavericks uh, reunion arena back in the mid-'80s, and he put up 50 against us, against Mark Aguirre, Rory Tarpley, Sam Perkins. These guys were out there trying to guard him. I'm on the inside trying to pick him up when he drives to the basket. He put 50 points up on us, and then a couple nights later went down to San Antonio to the Spurs and put up 50 on them. That was a back-to-back 50-point, 50-point night. Larry Bird was just a great, great player. Danny from Key Biscayne, Florida. Hey, James, any memories down here in Miami? Yeah, I love playing down in Miami. Uh, Now, the Heat weren't that good of a team when I was playing back in those days in the mid to late uh, mid-90s, early 90s. Uh, They were okay, but they weren't really the great team that they uh, became when Dwayne Wade and Shaquille O'Neal were there. Uh, Miami was a great place to go to. I mean, to get out of the uh, of the Arctic weather of you know Cleveland and Chicago and Detroit and all these other places, Milwaukee, to get down to Miami and to just have some sunshine uh, and to go out there and try to beat a you know relatively young, inexperienced uh, expansion team uh, was always a good challenge for everybody. Uh, Ronnie Cycli was one of their main stars back in those days. And he was a good, you know, undersized center, but very skilled in everything that he could do. Uh, so I enjoyed playing in Miami, uh, and it was just a great time back in those days. Another NBA top 50, Dave Cowens. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Dave and I served on the board with the Retired NBA Players Association for many years. Uh, and I, I mentioned to Dave when I first saw him, when I first met him in person off the court, that. Dave, you know, you were such a hustler, man. You you dove on the floor for loose balls. You did all the dirty, gritty work. But, you know, actually he was a pretty skilled basketball player. People forget that he he was a very, very good basketball player. Matter of fact, I think he was rookie of the year his first year in the league when he came in to the Celtics and uh, uh, was one of the smaller, undersized centers again that were battling against the likes of Kareem and and uh, Argus Gilmore and all these other big guys out there. So I really enjoyed playing against Dave Collins, and uh, he gave us fits from time to time, gave me fits as a smaller center who can shoot outside or quickly drive around you if you weren't on your on, on the best of, on top of your game. Yeah, he beat Cleveland in 76, uh, the 76 uh, uh, East Finals, so I remember that. Uh, another NBA Top 50, Clyde Drexler. Yeah, the Glide. Wow. You know, we had classic battles against the Portland Trailblazers when Clyde was at his peak and at his maximum. Whether I was playing for Seattle or with the Dallas Mavericks playing against the Portland Trailblazers, these teams out west in the Western Conference, we were always beating and battling each other, trying to take down the L.A. Showtime Lakers, of course. But between Portland and Utah and Dallas and Denver from time to time, the Sonics also, uh, we were always, you know, coming in second, third, fourth place, battling amongst ourselves. Uh, Clyde was a great player. I was smooth, uh, skilled, could shoot inside, outside, could jump out of the gym, uh, a great touch. 
he was, you know, and I, and I know he hates hearing this, and I know a lot of the guys who are kind of a, the, 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 the second version of hate hearing this, but he was kind of the poor man's Michael Jordan. Uh, but he was not a poor man at all. He played the game just as well as Michael did. And if he was featured the way Michael Jordan was featured at the Chicago Bulls, he would have been right on the same par, same level with Michael Jordan. Another NBA top 50, Dr. J. Julius Irving. Mm, I remember meeting Julius one time in, in person at a retired Players Association meeting. And it seemed like he was just walking on air. I mean, this guy was so classy, so elegant, so smooth, so respected amongst all the retired players and the current players, too. I played against Julius uh, his last two or three years in the league and my first couple of years or so. Uh, so he was excellent player and so well-respected. People just loved his, 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 his style, his grace, his elegance, but also – Wow. You know, you have to go back to the ABA days where he was really rocking and rolling every single night. Uh, and he brought a couple of few, few of those years with him to the NBA. Uh, and I don't think he gets the respect he does as one of the great all time small forwards who ever played the game. Yeah, I think because I guess because the NBA hadn't become that popular yet. And then when Michael Jordan came along or, or, and then, well, Bird and, uh, Magic and then Jordan, they kind of yeah. obliterated everything, just took over people's memory. But, yeah, Julius Irving was, uh, yeah, really people, oh, look at this guy. You know, he's, you know, they talked about <laughs> Jordan, you know, like flying, you know, and then that was, Ir- yeah. Julius Irving was, he was uh, he was in the air, you know, making moves and didn't yeah. know where he was yeah. going or what he was going to do with the ball. <laughs> yeah. Imagine, Peter, if we had social media back in those days, back in the 70s and the 80s, uh, when these great players, I mean, the Julius Irvings, uh, the George McGinnis, the the George Gervings, I mean, th- these guys put on shows every single – David Thompson, Skywalker – I mean, we don't have enough video footage of these guys to help people remember how truly great they were. Yeah, back in the 70s, there wasn't a lot of NBA games on TV, and the ABA had very little TV coverage. And so, right. uh, that's, so that's why it's like, oh, it's almost like it didn't happen if they're, unless you're on. Now with teeth, so much coverage. the So that's kind of a shame. It's, it is good to – keep bringing this guy. That's why I love history, bringing up guys who need to be remembered. <laughs> me too. Me too. Yes. Mm. Uh, okay, another NBA top 50, Patrick Ewing. Oh, yeah, Patrick. You know, I, I, I was a backup center to Patrick Ewing back in 1992 with the New York Knicks. Uh, they brought me in from the Dallas Mavericks, and I played about a half a season, three quarters of a season with the Knicks. Pat Riley was our coach. Uh, this was the real uh, New York Knicks team that Pat Riley had tuned to perfection to get out there and be physical. We had Charles Oakley. We had uh, Charles Smith. We had Anthony Mason, uh, John Starks, uh, so many great, great players. And Patrick Ewing was a leader of that team. I had never been on a team uh, throughout my whole NBA career that practice harder than we actually played in the games. We, we beat the living daylights out of each other in practice to get us ready to go out there and play for the game, play the game. And we'd bust out of those, those uh, locker rooms at Madison Square Garden. And Pat, Patrick uh, Riley, Pat Riley had us thinking that it was us against the world. And that's the mindset he instilled in us. And Pat Ewing filled that to perfection, being one of the great leaders and one of the hardest working players uh, and best big guys I've ever played against and played with. So I really, really enjoyed my short time with the Knicks, but a wonderful memory I'll never, ever forget. Our guest has been Mr. James Donaldson, who played in the uh, NBA from 1980 to 1995. He's the author of the book Celebrating Your Gift of Life from the Verge of Suicide to a Life of Purpose and Joy. Uh, the time has flown by. Hopefully we'll have uh, – there's no show next week, as Mark Mancini said. Hopefully we'll have uh, – Mr. Donald, James Donaldson, in two weeks. Uh, uh, Mr. Donaldson, do you have any uh, final words for our audience tonight? Well, you know, I still want people to pick up the book and read it. I think it's a great read. I think it's a very helpful tool 
to help anybody get through what they might be going through, especially mentally uh, challenge-wise, mental issue-wise. Uh, pick it up at celebratingyourgiftoflife.com. Uh, that order comes directly to me. I personally write a message in the book for you and sign my name to it, drop it in the mail to you within two or three days, and you'll have your own personally signed copy. So that's the best way to get it. Uh, and it really shows me that, you know, that we're, we are a community supporting each other. I keep track of everybody who contacts me and reach out to them from time to time to c- continue encouraging them and to encourage others that this mental health challenge is no joke. And we can get through it. We will get through it. And I just pray and hope everybody out there stays strong and get through these holidays supporting and loving each other. Oh, that's wonderful. Tremendous. Very inspiring. I thank you so much for coming on the show. We'll, hopefully we'll have you on in two weeks. In January, we've got Marty Gitlin, uh, sports author, January 11th. We're going to try to get Sam McDowell again. And anyway, I wish everyone a very Merry Christmas. Dear listener, may the road rise to meet you. May the wind be at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face and rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again... May God hold you in the palm of his hand. Good night, everybody. Merry Christmas. Thanks again, Mr. James Donaldson. Amen. All right. Thank you. Very good.